and a different role at this meeting. And thank you for being with us. Well, thanks, Bruce, for being generous, as always, with your comments. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you, for, thank you for coming out tonight on a rather cold and windy night. It's a pleasure, and uh, it's also my pleasure to uh, have put together what uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight. I've uh, enjoyed it immensely, and uh, I may be uh, I may be uh, more excited about it than, than some, but I'm very excited about this. So, uh, thank you for sharing it with me. Um, uh, the title is obvious, um, and I think most of you, judging by folks I'm seeing here um, either know Jack or know of Jack's work. Uh, certainly, um, yeah, most of you, if not all of you, know about the Enterprise Bulletin. So um, the history of the Enterprise Bulletin is in, in a significant way um, part of Jack's heritage and um, role in this community, so we're very proud of that. Uh, and over the years, um, there's been a small number of individuals, really, uh, who have um, had a huge and almost irreplaceable <coughs> impact on preserving the uh, heritage of Collingwood. One such individual, uh, as you might expect, is Jack McMurchie. Jack uh, is an award-winning journalist, and he was variously managing editor, general manager, and publisher of the uh, Enterprise Bulletin from uh, the early 1940s through to the 1970s. His life with the Enterprise Bulletin began in 1941. As I understand it, melting down type and sweeping floors, one of those uh, classic stories. Um, when he left the EB in 1977, he was publisher of the newspaper. After he did left the, uh, the EB, he subsequently purchased the Stainer Sun, and uh, subsequent to that, retired to Alliston, where he now lives. So during his time with the Enterprise Bulletin, and along with the many responsibilities that he obviously had, he managed to compose more than 330 articles on all aspects of Collingwood's community and business development. <coughs> a treasure trove, really, of well-researched and uh, colorfully written and insightful chronicles of this town. These articles are now indexed and cataloged uh, and are in our public library for all to use and see. Those binders sitting on the table over there are, in fact, all of Jack McMurchie's articles, all 330 of them, that he wrote during those years. So at this point, I'd like to introduce to you Jack McMurchie, who has come from Alliston to be with us tonight. <laughs> Jack is here with his wife, Marilyn, and uh, his daughter, Maggie. Uh, Maggie was um, the first person that I was able to contact to, um, to uh, set this in motion, and she's been most helpful, including driving um, Jack and Marilyn to, uh, to uh, Collingwood today. So thank you, Maggie, very much for being so helpful. So there's been a story to uh, how Jack's articles, um, and I hope, Jack, I hope I can refer to you as Jack. I hope I can do that. Uh, I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, these articles, didn't just kind of happen to jump out and at us, uh, you know, one day in, the, in a snowbank. But um, um, while Jack was managing editor in 1972, uh, he found himself in need of a so social society editor. Uh, the previous person doing that, uh, I guess, had retired. But uh, anyway, um, the, he found a woman to replace, and you'll recognize this name, some of you, Ruth Gibbons. So, uh, Ruth Gibbons at the time was the EB social columnist. Well, his choice for a replacement was Isabel Griffin, and you will remember her. Actually, she um, uh, passed recently, and um, uh, if you knew her, you knew that she had not only a prodigious capacity for turning out literature and, and, and uh, comments and gossip, um, but uh, she, uh, she also covered a wide variety of things other than just the social activity and calling. So she was kind of an interesting person. But I don't know whether Jack knew this or not, but um, Isabel kept an immense, and I truly mean immense, collection 
of uh, clippings and notes and just about everything else that she could find to clip out of something and put in. Now, um, after she passed away last year, um, someone had to go through all of those clippings. <clears throat> it turns out there were boxes and boxes of them. So one day, um, shortly afterward, one of her family members arrived at the library with at least nine, maybe ten boxes, I don't know, about that big, full of her clippings, those things that she would saved and uh, kept over the years, um, boxes of them, not in any particular order, except for the social columns that she wrote. <clears throat> and she, she kept a scrapbook. She kept nine or ten scrapbooks. And the, what she used for her scrapbooks were telephone books. So, you know, you can imagine a telephone book, but every page had a series of social clippings uh, pasted down, page after page. There are nine of them. Uh, and uh, so to this day, there are nine of those books over there in the library, if anybody chooses to go through them. I went through them, and I learned more about the gossip in Collingwood Society than I ever wanted to know. But uh, she did an unbelievable job of pulling that stuff together. Uh, so, next time you're in the library, uh, just drop up to the uh, local history. Carol, I, where's Carol? I'm assuming they're still there somewhere, Carol. Yeah. But ask Carol to dig those things out for you. It's just worth looking at. But um, um, anyway, um, when, um, I, just to go back a bit, she's the reason why we have all of Jack's clippings. Because one of the jobs I had as a volunteer at the library was to go through these nine or ten boxes that someone brought in. Uh, and although they weren't in any order, it became clear that she had kept all of Jack and Murchie's articles, 330 of them. So on reading a few of them, it became quite evident that this was really a, a truly useful and valuable historic kind of picture of calling them. So um, we set about to, uh, to index them and to kind of praise them and so on and so forth. Um, he called all of these articles turning back the pages. Although periodically, and I really don't understand, maybe Jack could explain why, uh, he called it, um, uh, Melissa, what did he call it? Um, there's another name he used, period. This is Collingwood? Th this is Collingwood? Yeah. yeah. Uh, every now and then there was a this is Collingwood thrown in to replace turning back the pages. <laughs> you know, but they still had the same focus and the same interest. Um, most of the articles dealt with the business community in Collingwood. So if you have any um, business history, links to the town. I suspect you'll find them in, among Jack's articles because he covered an immense number of them. But he also covered the community itself. So what I've done tonight um, is uh, selected some of the articles that he wrote about the community. I, I've not gone into the, um, to the, uh, the business side of it really. Um, and um, I've done so because I think, that, I think that you might find those interesting. Um, and what I've also done is I've just pulled out um, some of the articles. You'll see the articles. You won't be able to read them. And then i pulled out two or three paragraphs from what Jack wrote uh, about some interesting, what I find interesting aspects of calling it. So um, this is the index, by the way, that, that was put together. I think Carol's probably modified this somewhat. But there, there are 330 of these. So anything you need to find, you can go in. It's all alphabetical. And pull it out, and you'll find the article. This is what the library has done with that. Uh, so you will see photocopies of portions of those articles, certainly not the whole article. Um, so Melissa, and I, Melissa, thank you, by the way, for helping with this, because I wouldn't be able to push that and do this, too, at the same time. Melissa Shaw from the museum. <clears throat> so this article, um, Jack, you may remember this. This was called uh, An Ancient Record of Council Business Destined for the Archives. So in 1967, uh, there were a huge number of documents that were removed from an old vault in the municipal building, the town hall. The deputy clerk at the time, and by the way, they were about to be thrown out. The deputy clerk at the time had the wherewithal to provide Jack with the original handwritten minute book uh, of the town of Collingwood dated February 1858 through to the period 1863, a long time ago. So Jack, in his article, recounts uh, highlights of the minutes, including the names and the roles of significant community leaders who forged, really forged the future of our town. The minutes also deal with some mundane matters. One is a paragraph about an unidentified citizen who had stored 50 kegs 
of gunpowder and other explosives in his house. <laughs> he was closed down, of course, uh, by the town, and uh, that gave rise, interestingly, to the first bylaw to control gunpowder storage in this town. Who would know? The minutes uh, also recorded new bylaws to impose and collect fines and to license hotels and inns, of which there were many at the time. As you may know, in June of 1858, there were 17 houses of public entertainment in Collingwood. 17. Jack concluded this particular article by writing this. Times haven't changed that much, a reference to the issues of 1858 being much the same in the 1970s, as he said, proportionately and comparatively. The next item, uh, another, again, these were in random order, about the, uh, the railway. And as Jack wrote, the, the railway was here before the town was incorporated in 1858. <clears throat> he notes the importance of its role uh, as uh, with respect to Collingwood's uh, uh, development, and notes too that uh, the um, uh, railway was reflected in the coat of arms in the 1970s. Now, we've had a little discussion recently about the coat of arms. I don't know what the coat of arms of Collingwood is today. Um, there seem to be a couple of different ones on the go. But anyway, the one in, in, um, in the 1970s that Jack wrote about had a coat of arms that included reference to the railway. Uh, also a fish and a ship and a tiller of the soil. That was our coat of arms back then. So the first train steamed into Collingwood in 1855. Uh, and it was on the old Ontario Simcoe and Huron railway line. It was nicknamed Oats, Straw and Hay, as Jack recounts. This latter became the Northern Railway, and in 1858 was absorbed into the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada. In 1878, some years later, another line was uh, added to Collingwood, roughly where Walnut Street is now, it ran down to the shore, and it was called the Hamilton and Northwestern Line. As Jack notes, the railway was once a very powerful factor in local business, sharing with the local steamship companies the task of providing lifelines to other centers. This article does a good job of providing a perspective on the role of railways to Collingwood. <clears throat> the Daily Review. In 1863, Collingwood was home to a daily newspaper called The Daily Review. I wonder how many of you knew that. <laughs> I didn't until I read Jack's article. The Daily Review, 1863. And in the article, Jack acknowledged that he had never seen a copy of the review, but somehow he managed to get a hold of his first edition. This is the first edition of The Daily Review. The front page of the, of the review appears to focus on international issues more than those of Collingwood. Uh, it was published by a, a local man named George Foreman in the 1860s. He apparently received the bulk of the international news he had by telegraph, but uh, just to give an example of the kind of stuff that he was reporting in 1860 was the rebels carrying on the war in the U.S. Now, that was a piece written by a New York Times reporter uh, who apparently was with General Lee's Confederate Army. You know, you say, what's that got to do with calling? Well, I don't know, but it was interesting. Um, another item uh, dealt with the liability of railway companies concerning railway accidents. Now, that's interesting. And news really and contentious, of course, even today. So, as Jack would say, some of these might not change much. So, page two of the same thing uh, was a little more local. Uh, Norman uh, uh, was writing in an editorial. I think this is kind of revealing. Uh, he wrote, George Norman in 1860 wrote these words. In presenting our readers with the first number of the, they called it the number, with the first number of the Daily Review, we cannot help but look back at a time when Collingwood was a dismal cedar swamp, <laughs> not even fit for wild beasts to roam in. And when comparing its new position now, the only incorporated town in the county of Simcoe, we must confess, we being the Daily Review, no small amount of pride in being the humble means of establishing a daily newspaper. Other writings in the paper, this paper, uh, an inquest into the suspicious death of W. William Gibbard, uh, Gibbard, I should say. Uh, most of you would know that Gibbard was the original surveyor of the Collingwood area, and uh, most of the surveying work that was done back in those days was done by William Gibbard. So there, and his death uh, he died uh, prematurely, and there was always suspicion about how he died and why. There was also made about two chiefs um, surrendering at Manitoulin. No idea what that means, but uh, two chiefs, presumably from the First Nations tribe. The local train schedules were included, and the post office was advertising that it had 62 letters that had yet to be picked up. 
Now, uh, Melissa, I think the, the Jack recorded back then that the original copy of the review was, was held at the museum back then. Is it still held at the museum? I haven't seen it, but it may still, <laughs> it may still be there somewhere. <laughs> but that's interesting. So, I mean, this is, we're going back now, 1970, so um, uh, that takes us back 40 years, really, so it's hard to say. I hope it is. I hope it's there. <clears throat> And here's another one. This is kind of interesting. This is a, a piece which Jack wrote about an article in the Toronto Saturday Globe in 1893. The Globe's article is entitled, Collingwood, the Gate to the Great Lakes. I don't suppose you can read it, but that's what the title is. Collingwood, the Gate to the Great Lakes. <clears throat> in part, this is what it says. <clears throat> Collingwood is today the site of one of the busiest and most progressive towns in the province. The town was built prime because it was a necessity. Circumstances demanded a gateway between the great water stretches to the west and the railway system to the east. It went on, and I love this. Ontario is destined to be the manufacturing center for the northern part of the continent. And as Athens was the eye of Greece, so must Collingwood be the eye of this industrial hive. <laughs> now, in this particular article, Jack includes a rather long list of manufacturers at the time. Uh, with a lot of interesting names and facts about them. Uh, that's worth, this is worth looking at, actually. Um, and for example, in uh, 1893, there were 100 sailing vessels and nine steamers used by the calling of fishing industry. 100 sailing vessels and nine steamers. In 1892, there were 5,250,000 pounds of fish harvested here. And 94% of that um, stock went to the U.S., 94%. Interesting number. Prominent citizens of the time are also noted, along with details of the two shipping lines at the time. One was called the White Line, the other was called the Black Line. <laughs> this one, this article is entitled, The Town of 4,000 Acres Had a Few Firsts. And in this piece, Jack writes about the history of, of something called the Belden Atlas. Uh, the Belden Atlas exists in the, uh, there's a copy of it, but it exists in the library today, and it's a very interesting document. It was published in 1881. And um, apparently, back then, there was a group of salesmen that traveled through our area uh, selling space, advertising space, so-called, so uh, in the Atlas for $12. Um, and for $12, one's name could be included in that atlas. So the upshot was that many of the landowners at the time um, in the area um, thought this might be a good idea. They for $12, they could get their name in the atlas and have their name put on the map of the area. So if you um, take the time to look at this Belden uh, atlas, you will see this area, all of this area, and others around us. Uh, with details of all the land holdings of, uh, of our, some of our uh, descendants in the area, or six, um, uh, predecessors in the area. So that's worth looking at. Um, one of the interesting things in that map is that, uh, as Jack points out, where the Bateau, sometimes called Bata River, uh, enters into the, um, uh, the bay, there was a subdivision plan for that area, right at the mouth of that river. And that subdivision plan uh, was to have the name Sudbury. Never happened, of course, and I don't know where the plan went, but um, uh, that was in, the, it's, it's drawn through there. <clears throat> so that atlas, by the way, um, also has an expansive history, I think, of the Collingwood, uh, not a saga area, really, and if you haven't read it, it's, it's well worth reading. <clears throat> Next one, this is another um, uh, item that uh, Jack wrote about, Collingwood Illustrated, that's what it was called. Now, you'll recognize this um, author. This, this was uh, written by Collingwood Illustrated. It was written and published by a fellow named Fred Hodgson. And uh, it was published yearly, apparently. Uh, Fred Hodgson, as you know, was a man of very considerable fame in this town. Um, and uh, he was editor of what was then called The Enterprise in the 1870s. And he wrote some 45 technical books. And he lived in the US for a time, editor of the American Builder. But he always, also published a book of illustrations depicting home designs. I forgot what that book was called, but um, many of these uh, designs you'll see on <coughs> Hollywood streets today in fact, those houses were built around the turn of the century. Um, Jack was recorded the fact that uh, Fred Hodgson's once wrote in the 1850s that a trip from Duntroon, at that time it was called Bullmore, 
I was 14 to 15 miles of swamps, swales, and other obstacles. <coughs> the next one, uh, the first explorer after Brule mapped Georgian Bay. Now in this piece, um, Jack delves into the first explorer to map Georgian Bay uh, by ship. So he's out there in the bay. He refers to a Captain Gother man who lived from 1747 to 1830. And uh, man's surveys included most of the Great Lakes and specifically Lake Huron in 1788. With the purpose of surveying land, this is interesting, with the purpose of surveying land for an, an anticipated arrival of the United Empire Loyalists. His journey took him to Nottawasaga Bay, which was then called Iroquois Bay, where they dropped in here at the site of Collingwood. He called Collingwood back then Egg Hill. The land was examined uh, by, by man and marked it on chart on his charts as pretty good land suitable for settlements. Man also had place names for other areas. Meeker was called Point River. Owen Sound, believe it or not, was called Thunder Bay in his, uh, his documents. These names stayed in, in play until the War of 1812. <clears throat> so in an article uh, that Jack entitled One of the Town's Most Important Days um, is um, an extract really from um, what was then the Toronto Daily Mail on May 25, 1883. And it outlines the events associated with the christening ceremony of the Collingwood Dry Dock called Queen's Buck Dry Dock back in those days. Jack cites an article on the christening day to his, his words. The dry dock project had been, <clears throat> excuse me, the dry, dry dock project has been before the people of Collingwood for many a day. And now, when it is just on the eve of completion, the people feel that they are likewise on the eve of completing an old and entering a new era of prosperity. The Queen's birthday was selected as the most fitting time for the celebration. And on that day, 1883, several thousand people gathered around the dock when the official party took the positions on the upper deck of a boat steamer, I guess called Oneida. It was a huge one, and it was brought in especially for the event. According to Jack, the, uh, the town at the time, the municipality, uh, gave, um, gave $25,000 toward the construction of that dry dock. So that dry dock, which of course you know is still in evidence there, dates back to 1883. Now here's the thing, and I've got to ask Jack what this is, because I don't get it. Um, in this article, he headlined this, they talked of a Georgian Bay Canal. Well, I don't know if you ever heard of a Georgian Bay Canal, but I see someone shaking their head, but I, maybe I'll need to talk to you afterwards to see what the canal was, I had no idea. But the article was briefly about the canal. He, uh, uh, he said that it had been debated for six or seven years, but then it was quashed, by whom I don't know, presumably the, the municipality. But, um, Apparently, the idea of the canal was to shorten the run from the Upper Lakes to Montreal by 282 miles. So that's one big canal. Um, so anyway, in the article, Jack moves on to mention plans for Collingwood's Harbor. And the first plans for Collingwood's Harbor were put together in 1852. Um, the plans at that time showed 13 to 17 feet of depth in the harbor, and I think that's probably just about what it is now. Um, more than any other harbor on the Great Lakes, apparently. <clears throat> he then goes on to describe the various trade connections between cities around the Great Lakes and, and uh, harbors, both ship and train destinations that existed in the 1850s. And he talks a lot about the cargoes on those ships and, uh, and many of the voyages that they were making at that time. <clears throat> so this one, entitled, Old Journal Recalls Early Days and Cost of Shipbuilding, um, it refers back in a way to an earlier article about the Queen's Dry Dock. Uh, as it turns out, Jack reported, there was no record of the first vessel built in Collingwood. Now that was back in 1870, there may well be one now. But it was known that three ships were built here in, between 1857 and 1858, before the Dry Dock was constructed. The Queen's Dry Dock carried under that name until 1889, a period when wood was giving way to steel and steam shipbuilding. In that year, the dry dock became the Collingwood Dry Dock and Wrecking Company. Later, it was sold to become Collingwood Shipbuilding Company. So that's where that name comes from. An old journal, which Jack cites in his article, records all sorts of costs associated, associated with shipbuilding between 1891 and 1892. Wages at the time appeared to have been in the $2 range per day. And specific individuals, 
how long their pay are noted. So if you knew someone working for the shipbuilder, shipbuilding company back in those days in the 1890s, you wanted to know how much they were earning, they're in Jack's article. <laughs> they help us peek into the history of Collingwood. Apparently local folks at the time uh, loved to drop stuff off to Jack, um, but particularly they had some historical kind of um, um, aspect. Um, often they found these things behind walls that they were tearing down or in musty trunks and so on. Uh, Jack writes about a piece, one piece, um, an illustrated booklet of calling with the dates 1904 that was printed in uh, Battleground, Michigan. That's what this article is about. Um, other items in this particular article include the near drowning of three little girls, Lily Wright and Rita and George, George Georgia Collins. But those names are familiar to many of us here in Collingwood, um, and I presume the families know about it, but there's, there's a story about those young girls and, and how they were uh, uh, saved. Uh, local advertising in that particular publication, 1909, Oxford Shoes, $1.50. Uh, the Grand Opera House, where the town hall is today, um, featured a performance called The Night of the Play, cost 35 cents. <laughs> Articles such as this one, composed by Jack, really made uh, make good reading for anyone that's interested in the way it was. These are these are colorful pieces, and I'm just not really paying um, as much um, giving them as much credit as I should, simply because I'm trying to go through them reasonably quickly. Here's a piece that uh, Jack touched on. This is actually an ad from an article, but this is an ad for a thing called Poetical Directory of Calling, which to me is a very odd name. It appeared in 1875. It was printed in Aurelia. Uh, I haven't seen it, but Jack infers that it contained the work of advertising men waxing poetic. The newspaper item surrounding this ad is also interesting. For example, the, the article around the article, or around the ad, um, details, provides details about the estate of J.J. Long. Uh, some of you will recognize that name. J.J. Long was one of the founders of this town, really. But the estate, he was a wealthy man. Uh, and the estate was in incredible detail about where all his money went and came from and whatnot. It's a very interesting read for anybody that has an interest in J.J. Long. Um, that item, along with the others, is cataloged in, in those in, uh, binders over there. So the next one, old houses yield clues of, and knowledge of, ta of the town, of the town's historical background. <clears throat> so this article is about another find behind a wall of an old home on Birch Street that was being renovated. A copy of the Collingwood Bulletin dated 1886. Its editor, J.A. Curry, who, as some of you know, went on to become a member of Parliament. The bulletin contained important news. A bicycle race at the roller rink, a local lady having a man charged for using threatening and abusive language. Apparently he was fighting four dollars ultimately. The plays at the music hall, a social evening at the Baptist Church, a band from Cape Crocker Reserve appearing at the Great Northern Exhibition, and a new bell telephone line from Derry, 1886. Jack provides an account of a farmer, Newman, chasing his property, chasing from his property, a group of rowdy and troublesome boys by firing, at, by firing shot at them. <laughs> Seemed reasonable, but an editorialist took a different slant on this incident. It read, it's high time Mr. Newman took a stroll out of this man's town, as the rackets raised around his ranch nightly are a disgrace to a civilized place like this. <laughs> Apparently, Mr. Newman wasn't too popular. <clears throat> the GTR elevator. Uh, Jack took, I think, considerable interest in elevators. There were quite a number of pieces on the elevators. Um, in this one, he describes the Grand Trunk Railway elevator that was built in 1870 by the Northern Railway Company. It subsequently became the property of Grand Trunk, later to become CNR. This was the second elevator built in our harbor. <clears throat> it was demolished in 1937. Uh, the first elevator was built in 1855, but uh, it very quickly became too small and inadequate. So the close of navigation doesn't mean, doesn't mean an end to work at the Collingwood terminals. This, the new elevator, the one we have now, was built in 1929. And in this article, Jack goes in great, into great detail about the people who worked at Collingwood Terminals in the, in the 1950s. He notes, too, that in 1948, some 17 million bushels of grain arrived in Collingwood, but the St. Lawrence Seaway apparently began to cut into business, and by 1953, only 11 million bushels were handled. 
<coughs> that terminal building has 126 bins. It's capable of holding 2 million bushels. And as an aside, um, I, from what I understand, Jack didn't write about this, but that building was constructed on top of cedar posts. And if I'm not mistaken, there's some 26,000 underneath that building or more. And I gather that's the reason why people are concerned about water levels, because the water level goes down, the posts get rotten, and the building falls down. So I think that's kind of an interesting scenario. I'm sure they have ways to fix that, but that's 26,000 posts underneath that thing. Hard to believe. I heard something. These are, uh, of course, newspapers did have advertising. One of the major industries that Colgate had back in, in the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, was Bryan Manufacturing. This was uh, one of their um, ads um, that uh, was published, uh, I guess it was part of one of Jack's articles. Uh, these ads, there are three different ones here, and they, they were published between 1895 and 1902. Bryan Manufacturing, of course, was located where Coffin that furniture used to be located, which is now an empty lot. No. Or Sobe. Sorry, I'm sorry. It was the aviation. I got the wrong spot. My apologies. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> True enough. Amateur archaeologist. Um, many of you will know the name Charles Garrett and Jay Blair. Um, you will also, I think, know that First Nation settlements <clears throat> were very common in the Collingwood area back in the early 1600s. Um, and Jack made sure he included some articles about them. Notably, he describes the work of well-known archaeologists Charles Garrett and Jay Blair. <clears throat> the latter has passed away, but Charles is still alive and recently published a rather massive book on the First Nations, Petons notably, uh, who lived in this area at that time. Um, Charles is a frequent visitor to Collingwood. Uh, he's worked extensively with the museum and the, the uh, Craig Leaf uh, Museum and um, is responsible really for a massive collection of uh, artifacts from uh, those days in the 1600s, done digs all over the area. Um, one nation, the Petons, which I mentioned, uh, had as many as 10 villages in this immediate area. Most of them were on the eastern slopes of Blue Mountains, facing the bay. <clears throat> uh, and this article done by Jack contains excellent detail on community life in our region 400 years ago. Of interest, if you know the old, I'm sure you do, the old Craigley Schoolhouse uh, that's uh, really on Lakeshore Road where Blue Mountain Road meets um, uh, Highway 26 behind the Craigley Depot, um, <clears throat> there's a steep ridge directly behind that um, old schoolhouse and at the top of that ridge, at one time in the early 1600s, well, at the top there is a plateau. In the early 1600s, was one of the more important Petun villages at the time. Uh, that particular location was extensively dug uh, by uh, uh, Charles Garrett and uh, Jay Blair. You can actually get up there um, and see the uh, the evidence of where those digs took place. <coughs> Pile of artifacts they took out of there, but that was a very important village at one time. And related to that um, was a rock. Now, I don't know really how to pronounce this, but I'm going to say it's Ekaran non the you know, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I can say it a thousand ways. And there's always been a debate about this rock, apparently, about whether it was or wasn't a spiritual place for uh, our First Nations um, uh, folk back in the 1600s. I believe that rock, if you uh, are up in Gibraltar at the top of the uh, escarpment, <coughs> And if you take the road right out of Gibraltar, heading directly east toward the escarpment, you eventually come to an end of the road, which is at the escarpment. You meet up with the Bruce Trail there. If you get out of your car and walk about a quarter mile to the south, you come to these bluffs. They may be the Ulster Bluffs, I'm not sure. But uh, as you're walking by, of course, you're right on the edge, and you'll come to a point where you will see that rock. If you haven't been up there, it's, it's worth walking through. It's quite interesting. Now, according to um, some um, historians, uh, this was um, a, uh, an item that had religious, religious, spiritual, I should say, significance for them. Um, uh, Champlain uh, apparently uh, was in the area, and uh, I'm not sure we made reference to it, but uh, was aware of it. Uh, so this is another article that Jack did that has a lot of, of very 
good detail on community life back in the 1600s in that area. Um, so that rock is brilliant to see. I mean, it's an amazing structure. And it stands out from the uh, bluffs, probably 100 yards maybe, all alone. So if you haven't done it, you might want to try that one. <coughs> so Gaiety Theatre. Well, this is just a picture. But um, Jack wrote about the Gaiety Theatre um, and uh, its famous signage. This picture, this photo was taken in 1935. Uh, it's at the corner of here, Ontario, Ontario streets, as you know. Uh, but at one time, that was um, that location was occupied by this is a, another name I've seen for this, the Blue Bell Hotel. But you will also see that as the True Blue, and uh, so it seems to have some various names. Anyway, in 1925, that theater was opened as the Empire Theater. Later, it became the Rex Theater, and um, as Jack records, somehow or other, it had 666 seats. I I wonder about that. But anyway, the, the game was open around 1929, and it was the first theater north of Toronto to have sound. So its first sound picture was Al Jolson in a, in a movie called The Singing Fool. Uh, while I'm on the Gaiety and theaters, I should mention that Hella Sandberg, and Hella's here tonight, I saw her. There she's back there. Um, with the help of Sharon McNabb, uh, uh, Hella's compiled a book on the history of theater in Collingwood, and it's quite the uh, Quite the production, really, well worth reading. Very surprisingly large volume as well. And uh, it's currently available in the library, I think, as well now. So if you're interested in that, you might. Uh... May I just correct that? That's Sharon's book. Not Sharon's book. Sharon's book. Yeah, she did okay, well, I know she did a lot of work. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Yes. Um, a, lot of, a lot of unbelievably detailed work done by Sharon. Here on Institute. Um, you know, one of the uh, great, um, what should I say, um, <laughs> historic, um, I don't know any words for it, uh, one of the, the in, important contributing factors to the history of this town was the Huron Institute. <clears throat> uh, it was um, originally established by a gentleman by the name of David Williams, who um, also shared, um, as Jack did, uh, editorship of the, the Enterprise, Enterprise Bulletin, and uh, many, many other documents that he put together. But um, uh, Jack, in this article, does a very good job of outlining the, uh, the history of what is our now museum. The Huron Institute survived in the basement of the old library, Carnegie Library, until 1963 when it was burned down. And a lot of the uh, relics and the artifacts and so on that were in that particular museum now are find their way into our museum here, as well as the Simcoe County Museum. But um, um, interestingly, during that fire, uh, many of the neighbors and surrounding community did their best to retrieve whatever they could uh, from that fire. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the artifacts that were in there were taken home by people because they didn't know what to do, and they took them home because they had to find someplace to put them. Well, sadly. A lot of them never got back, um, but many did, um, and those that did, as I say, are with the museum here and uh, the Simcoe County Museum. Um, but David Williams, uh, truly, um, he, he wrote, he, he was involved and recorded one of the more poignant chapters in preserving the history of our town. If you're unfamiliar with David Williams uh, and his immense volume of work, I, I really recommend you come to know him and the work that he did. It's, it's truly amazing. The things he was involved with defy all reality. Um, one of the important things that was saved, and I think this is correct, this is what Jack reported, is that I think most of you would be familiar with a series of books called The Jesuit Relations. <clears throat> the Jesuit Relations is a published um, series of books on Jesuit letters, mostly written back to France. Uh, all of those letters have been recorded in these leather bound books that are in the library. Now, my understanding is that there are a very few sets that exist today. Someone said three, but I don't know if that number's correct or not. That's what I've heard. You've heard that too, Carol? So three sets of the Jesuit relations, leather bound, 48 volumes of them, um, are in our library under lock and key. Um, I've looked through some of them. It, it's curious reading, I must say, but um, well, there's a history of this entire kind of Nautilus saga of Georgian Bay area in there that uh, is amazing. So Jack wrote about that too. 
excuse me, got to watch my time here. The, the beauty of this is I can stop any time when you see you're kind of falling over. Stop. <laughs> Protection uh, to persons, the beauty of the police department. Now this was about the police department, of course, uh, in the uh, in the 1960s when Jack wrote about this. Um, but he did talk a little bit about policing back in the 1858 period. The chief constable at the time was, was paid $100 per year. I believe he was a volunteer, and he had eight volunteer constables that worked for him. This may seem like a large number for the time, but as Jack records, Collingwood was in a rough frontier town with a bustling port, sawmills, and taverns where good liquor could be purchased by the gallon. <laughs> the constables, eight of them, received one dollar a night for their efforts, and apparently they spent most of their time wheeling around the central ward, as they called it, on their bicycles. The ward included the business area and the docks. Um, so, in this piece as well, he, he talks about the names of the constables back then. It's kind of interesting. You may have relatives back there. Sawmills. Yeah. So this article talks about a land deed dated 1843. Uh, it contains title to a, an original crown grant of land that Jack proposed may have been the first grant given to any industry in Collingwood, 1843. The land was a parcel of 100 acres, extending from Ontario Street south to what is now Hume Street, and from Raglan on the west side to Lakeshore, as it was called, on the west side. Its title was Mill Reserve. In 1843, as you know, our community was called, referred to anyway as Hen and Chickens, a reference to the island formation just outside the harbor. Original inhabitants at that time were clustered around a mill, hence mill reserve, that had been established at the mouth of the Pretty River. Uh, the community was then known as Community City Mills. And according to Jack, um, at least according to Jack, and his article goes on to explore details of many mills that were located in this area. So once again, a uh, history of the many mills that um, uh, Collie was noted for. City Mills was um, also um, called Old Village at the time, and it, it was obviously the hub of local industry back then. It had a brewery, a small boat building business, and the beginnings of a local fishing industry. Jack notes too that in 1964, really not that long ago, the, one of the original grinding millstones, which was imported from France, was still at that site down the mouth of the Pretty River. Apparently the mill was still operating in the 1960s, long gone now. Sunset Point. I didn't know this. My wife didn't know this. Um, but apparently um, a marina was operated in the 1960s called Sunset Point Marina. Uh, some of you will remember that. Uh, in 1961, apparently, the, uh, the operator gouged out, as Jack records, uh, the shoreline to a depth of about eight feet and um, provided accommodation of about 60 boats. But apparently the uh, marina just simply deteriorated for reasons unknown, as Jack said, and were never replaced. But uh, Jack had a, a, an interesting comment here in this piece. I'm just going to um, repeat it verbatim. During the prosperous years since the last war, when the tourist trade has grown to undreamed levels, Collingwood has literally missed the boat. The luxury cruisers, for the main part, set courses that have not included Collingwood, simply because the port does not have facilities to accom accommodate them. This has been our great loss. So it seems that the Collingwood Harbor uh, has been the subject of much debate over the years, and it remains so. Now this just uh, <coughs> pulls out an ad, 1912, these are Fords, and they were on display uh, at a local garage back then called the Collingwood Garage. And that was one of the, I guess, first automobile um, showcase houses, uh, facilities. Uh, a couple more. Uh, these cars apparently cost $535. And if you wanted electric starting and electric lights, you paid extra $85 extra. <laughs> the day when royalty came to town, 18, 1918, the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire, along with the Canada's Governor General, came to town, or came to town, yeah, to launch a new ship. Every dignitary in town was on hand, and Jack lists virtually every one of them, a veritable calling with who's who in 1918. The Duke described Collingwood as, an exempl as exemplifying the best features of Canada and Canadians. Schools were closed for the day and the town was adorned with banners and flags, and Jack provides a wonderful account of this particular event. Another photo. This was of photos, this photo is of soldiers uh, heading off to uh, uh, 
battle in World War I. Um, this was accompanied by a, a piece about the calling of volunteers for the war. Uh, they were members of the 35th Regiment of the Simcoe Foresters, later sent to the 4th Battalion in Britain. So Jack didn't miss them either. Next one. Here's another one of those funny little things. The High School Times. Uh, Ralph Snape would remember this, I'm sure. In fact, maybe you uncovered this one, Ralph, I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, once again, Jack back then had a way of coming up with unusual finds. And here's one, High School Times, produced by the Colonial Collegiate in 1877. No idea what it is. Now in this piece, uh, Jack goes back briefly in this article to uh, Collingwood Collegiate, but he spends more time in this article talking about the grammar schools in Collingwood. Uh, he starts by referring to the first grammar school of the town actually being built in the municipality in 1858. Uh, but then in 1857, a petition was filed with Simcoe County seeking to establish a grammar school, and uh, such a school was opened that year in a room in the International Hotel, which is where the Bank of Montreal building stands today. The school leader moved to the True Blue House, and you remember earlier I talked about it being a Blue Bell House. I don't know which one was right, but apparently it had two names. Jack recorded uh, both. Um, another grammar school was later built on Pine Street, and then another on St. Paul Street. The permanent school that was finally constructed in 1874 was the one at the corner of Hume and Ontario Street, which is no longer there, and which is our famous hole in the ground. <laughs> so this is the, I think, the last slide that I have here. Uh, yeah, now this is a photo of a fellow named um, Buri. I don't know whether that name rings a bell. We have J.M. Buri. So uh, that photo um, um, is of a Buri. And Jack prepared the article in 1967. But this is about, this article is about Buri who explored the length of calling, the history of calling between 1853 and 1880. So this is his picture. Um, and this article is what I would regard as a must-read, really, for anybody that's interested in this town's past. Uh, again, it's, it's contained in those books. Murray speaks of Collingwood as comprising 644 acres in 1853. He describes it as a dense bush of tangled tamarack and cedar swamps. At Christmas time, 1853, there were only four families living in, in Collingwood. So work began on a wharf, breakwater and railway in 1854. And that brought men into the area, lots of them, all of whom needed accommodation and a drink or two, hence multiple hotels springing up. Oh, Maggie's youngster. In 1855, the Corps was uh, subdivided into lots. This is something that um, uh, many of you may not be aware of. Um, in 1855 and 1856, the downtown core, really, uh, on the um, west side of here, Ontario, was subdivided into lots. Those lots uh, were advertised widely uh, in publications in Markham and Newmarket and surrounding areas as being for sale. Uh, the prices were exorbitant uh, that, that were put to the, uh, those lots by the owners at the time, one of them being Smith, uh, who used to be a constable here in Collingwood back in those days. Interestingly enough, in the 1856 period, Canada went through a bit of a recession, and Collingwood was not, did not escape from that. Those properties, fell dramatically in value, to the point they couldn't get rid of them. So there was a boom and bust period in Collingwood, land-wise anyway, in 1855 and 56. Um, now, um, as I said, Jack didn't write this piece, he recorded the piece. Uh, it's a piece well worth reading. If you do have a chance to go through these, please do. So Jack, we're indebted to you, very indebted to you. Um, these are a small number of 330 plus articles that you wrote. Uh, makes an outstanding contribution to understanding and learning about our community. Uh, we can't thank you enough for that. Uh, and, you know, especially Jack, thank you for being with us tonight. A lot of people here tonight were very excited that you would be with us. And I hope you have a chance to meet some of your old colleagues and friends uh, who are here. And I'm sure dying to get the whole get rid of me and say hello to you. Um, and Maggie, again, thank you for, um, for making it possible for Jack to be with us. Um, tomorrow morning on the beach, the, one of our local radio stations, Jack, I'll be talking a little more about you. So um, uh, I hope that goes well. Um, but Jack, thank you so much. Um, Carol Stewart uh, from the library is here. And 
she brought with her the binders, and Carol has done some work on the indexing of these things. And Carol, if you could take a minute to explain the indexing, so those that would like to uh, take advantage of them may be a little more, a little more easy to work their way through it. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> gave me this earlier today, I should have mentioned this, the McMurchie Settlement. Anybody heard of that? Well, Jack McMurchie it is a descendant of that McMurchie family. Um, Jack's great-grandfather, Peter McMurchie, uh, was one of three brothers who started that community in the 1840s, up at the end of 6th Street at uh, the Old Sir Bluff uh, side road. And uh, John Thomas McMurchie was your grandfather, I understand. And uh, Thomas Clarence McMurchie was your, your father. So anyway, Jack, aside from all of the stuff he did, has historic roots right back to the early days of this community. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, you did a wonderful job. Uh, Peter is one of my volunteers at the uh, library, which is how he got involved in this whole thing when he was sorting through the Isabel Griffin collection, um, which is where we got these articles. And I really wanted to get them indexed so that people could, could see them and, and uh, use these. Um, there's a lot of historical material on here, but also there's another um, whole area that is absolutely invaluable to the library. And that is um, that many of these articles are dealing with all the businesses in town. And I think... Uh, <laughs> Jack must have known just with everybody in town and had interviewed everybody in town uh, to do with business. And I have, um, this past week, working from the index that Peter created, um, I went through all the um, names on here, we added to them, and we have now put them so that they are available online through our database. So if you want to look up a business and find out whether we have any information on that business from the 1960s. Um, we owe a great thank you to Jack McMurchie for making this available to us. Um, unfortunately, we have a lack of information in the library on those years um, in terms of directories. Um, we had tremendous directories going up to about 19, 10, 11. Then we had one in 1924, and then little snippets here and there. But until 1990, nobody ever thought to save old telephone books or anything else. I am constantly getting phone calls and emails uh, requesting information on people's grandmother who lived on such and such a street or whose grandfather had a business on the main street and wants information on the, on the business and want to know exactly where that business was located. These articles are giving us that information which is absolutely invaluable to us. Um, so. You, if you would like, you can come up and have a look through these. Uh, the indexes are at the front, um, so you can look through and see the sort of information that's available on these. But I have um, cataloged these and put them in as, as directories for Collingwood because the information on there is directory material because you can look up every business, the, the names of the business people, we couldn't obviously include them all. But uh, there were 11 pages, I think, of uh, basically 50 names per page um, that has all been indexed now. And um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a great work. Um, we are thrilled to have it in the library. We owe a huge thank you to Isabel Griffin who got us going on it. But there are more articles that aren't in here of Jack McMurchie's. And um, over the next year or so, I intend to get those together too because there are some from the early 1970s. There's one here, one there. But I know that there are others in between because when you have number one and you have number you know, 15, you know that there's a lot missing in between. So we're going to get those together for you too, Jack, and put those in there so that they're always available for the public to use. And I want to thank you for writing those articles. And, um, and we are just tickled pink to have them in the library. Thank you. Back again for a second, Joan Miller just reminded me. Uh, Jack, um, a fellow by the name of Glenn Brock is here. Mm -hmm. He's back there. 
Uh, I gathered you two, he was the last employee, as I understand, when you were there, that he worked with you, uh, and you haven't seen each other for 40 years. So Jack and Glenn, you're connected. Have a good evening. <laughs> It's not very often that I get the opportunity to thank three people, but uh, this is the one occasion, and I would like to thank Carol for the work that she's done on making this material available to the general public and adding it to our collection. I saw what you guys got from Isabel, and we also received boxes and boxes and boxes. Apparently, when uh, it was... Uh, it was Isabel passed away, she had left all of her possessions very clearly marked as to where they were to go. And when you opened up a cupboard, there was a sign in the cupboard which said, this goes to the Historical Society. You went to the next cupboard or the next room and you opened up the cupboard, this cupboard was filled, there was the sign, this goes to the library. Uh, so Isabel, uh, thank you for doing what you did to preserve our history in the way that you did. And Carol, thank you for doing what you're doing at the present time. Thank you, Peter, for bringing to our attention what I, I'm almost prepared to say is a primary source of information and material about Collingwood's history. Anyone who's going to be writing or researching any topic in uh, our past if they don't consult these columns and these articles, they're missing the boat, and they will not have the complete story. So thank you, Peter, for bringing that to us. And thank you, Jack, for writing them and giving us so much of our past. We really do appreciate that. Peter, thank you again for the presentation, and if you would come forward, I'd like to give you a tangible thank you. Well, thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. And as I've said, you're a great